Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for attending this, the uh, second week of organizational sociology, that's Sociology 455. Uh, thank you for coming to lecture. Uh, this week's lecture will address the Hawthorne effect in a little bit more detail. And what I'm going to do is give you the nutshell version of the story behind Hawthorne. So let's go ahead and get to work. Now, you've probably encountered Hawthorne effect before in some of your uh, other courses, possibly. Uh, but what I, you may not have really gotten into some of the background uh, and what it did prove. Sometimes uh, people learn more from what they disprove or from what they, when they expect to find one thing and they find something else than uh, the intended hypothesis they were, they were uh, attempting to test in the first place. So <laughs> the Hawthorne effect gets some flack, but it also gets uh, some praise. So let's go ahead and dive into that. The Hawthorne effect simplified is an increase in worker productivity as a result of the psychological stimulus of being singled out and made to feel important. That again is the nutshell version of what is the Hawthorne effect. The problem is that the individual behaviors of workers may be altered by the presence of the researchers doing the study itself rather than the effects the study is researching. So this was demonstrated in the research project conducted from 1927 to 1932 at the Hawthorne plant at the Western Electric Company in Cicero, Illinois. So the, the experiment was kind of set up like this. Uh, research, the researchers uh, from Harvard Business School, uh, including Professor Elton Mayo and his associates, studied two things. They planned to study the environmental variables in the workplace, such as how does humidity and lighting levels affect worker productivity. Okay, the second thing they wanted to study is psychological variables, such as uh, do the number of working hours uh, you know, per day, per week, per month, uh, the managerial leadership, break, the, the introduction of breaks or the lack of breaks, group pressure, etc. How does that affect worker productivity? Now remember, we're talking 1927 to 1932. We did not have in place the kind of worker protection we do now. And actually studies like the Hawthorne study, <laughs> uh, to, to some extent, uh, introduced the concepts of you know, how, how we now consider just ethical treatment of workers. So as we're reading this, if, if you think this sounds a little bit obvious, realize these were, this is another one of those studies that was paving the way for the way we do business in business organizations now and, and the way we're supposed to at least ideally treat people. But you've probably read studies and maybe some of the modern studies as to which kinds of scents make people work better or which you know appeal most to people, which kinds give their, them energy, what kind of music puts them to sleep, that sort of thing. So yeah, th this was the kind of, uh, on, a, on a, a, a more, uh, scientific level or applicable level, they were trying to actually test different variables in the workplace, both uh, relationship oriented and also environmental. So uh, the ideas that this team developed uh, about the social dynamics of groups in the work setting had lasting influence. So the collection of data La labor to management relations and the, kind of these informal interactions among factory employees, these were all things that they were they wanted to know more about. They wanted to test the, the different variables involved. And this is what the researchers found. This is what the, 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 those who were studying this found. The dependent variable, the outcome of just about every little experiment and study with, that associated with, the, with Hawthorne, was that it was almost always that regardless of the experimental manipulation employed, the production of the workers seemed to improve. <laughs> now, uh, possible reasons include one big screaming one, 
that workers liked or at least responded to the attention received from researchers. <laughs> so just the presence of the researchers changed the dependent variable, changed the outcome. Okay, now uh, yeah, th this is why participant observation or, you know, the, just the presence of the researchers themselves could change the chemistry. We, we've got this wonderful demonstration of this. Uh, so this, the study was scheduled to last a year, but researchers were unable to correlate correctly the manipulated uh, physical conditions with the workers' efficiency. So the project took five years. And if you're noticing, it straddled the uh, fall of the stock market and the uh, you know, beginning of the Great Depression. You're right. So what a time to be a sociologist. What a time to be studying social behavior. Uh, so yeah, these were these were business. This was a, a business school professor. He was a Harvard Business School professor, and you know they were studying you know, human behavior and the environment, the uh, organizational environment. What a, an amazing time to be studying that! So the conclusions uh, initially of the Hawthorne the Hawthorne study were: first of all, the intellectual aptitudes of individuals are imperfect predictors of job performance. Although they give some indication of the physical and mental potential of the individual, the amount produced is strongly influenced by social factors. What that mouthful means is that just because somebody has a really high IQ does not mean that they are better at their job. It's not, IQ is not going to be a predictor of how good somebody is at their job. Um, Although it can give some indication as to whether they can handle certain challenges, maybe, or complex, uh, you know, pattern recognition, really it was negligible. The amount produced is much more strongly influenced by the social factors, by social factors. So uh, think about the people with whom you work and how, you know, the working environment in, in any job. You, you can have your dream job, but if, you, if you're surrounded by uh, Co-workers and a boss who is, you know, kind, of, you know, you feel is constantly trying to stab you in the back, or there's that constant friction. You know, it's gonna, it's going to really make it much more difficult to work in that environment than if you feel you have co-workers who support you, a boss who's always looking out for you, and you tend to then kind of look out for them. And there's, there's that, that kind of. Uh, you know, positive symbiotic relationship. I wish that for all of you, initially, you know, incidentally. But uh, you, you probably had a job or maybe a class where the chemistry just didn't work. And it doesn't mean that they're bad people. It means that when you pull, you know, you could pull them out and put them into a different social environment and they could be totally different. Maybe we are totally different when we get out of that social environment. Um, but I'm sure you, if not you, then somebody else you've talked to has said, you know, just this work environment was just poisoned, you know, by by uh, the, the the social stress, the stress of the the uh, social environment. So, yeah, they came to the conclusion that social factors heavily influenced uh, the, the you know the the, the uh, job performance of the workers at Hawthorne. Another conclusion: informal social organization affects productivity. So relations between workers and supervisors, back to what we were saying before, and workers tend to influence the manner in which the workers carry out directives. So the clarity, of, you know, the, 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 the whole bunch of variables involved in that. They also observe that work groups establish norms, which in turn affect productivity. We've talked about that in, in week one, where we talk about the, you know, setting that pace, that, that, the, when we talked about the speed up, and we talked about you know, what was expected of a worker. Based, you know, they walk in day one based on what the other workers are doing, and everybody kind of falls into step and produces about the same amount. Groups arrive at the norms of what constitutes a day's work. And a fourth conclusion, uh, they, they, they found that the workplace really is a social system. And, you know, again, nowadays we kind of go, well, yeah, but realize this was really, this, this was cutting edge stuff. They were finding out, look, 
if people are unhappy uh, in, in the, with the social fabric of their work environment, of their organization, they're, they're not going to be as productive. They're not going to be as, uh, you know, as, as, as maybe as dedicated or devoted necessarily. There are a lot of variables there. But, you know, a, when you're talking about predicting whether, not just whether somebody produces more, or, but also things like recidivism, are they going to stay? Are they going to go? Is there a high turnover rate? You know, so the Hawthorne researchers came to view the workplace as a social system made up of interdependent parts. And I'm sure you can see why that just screams organizational social. That is organizational social, where you look at an organization as a system, a social system made up of interdependent parts. Think back to Durkheim and structural functionalism, where all these structures you know, exist in every society. You have uh, all these different structures. And if you, if they're like gears on a clock because of the functions, because of the relationships between the structures. If you turn one gear on the clock, all the other gears turn. And that is what happened kind of a, this is kind of a mini society, kind of a microcosm of society, but it's also got its own personality and character. So they came to that conclusion. And again, that was cutting edge stuff at the time. Now, uh, let's critique this a little bit and say, look, Two variables may be responsible for the improvement in productivity that happened almost every single time. They, so when you have the, this percentage of being wrong, it's like, wait a minute, we got we got to go back and look at this. It's not a matter of and you, and when if you're going on to your capstone, please consider this. Uh, while we do ask you, like, in when you're doing any kind of study, to propose a hypothesis. You know, what do you think you will find? Um, being wrong in that prediction, that educated guess, is not a cardinal sin. As long as the research tells you something, as long you, you need to learn from the conclusion. So whether your hypothesis is proved or disproved or partially disproved, yeah, the, 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 the main thing is to gain information about social phenomena. And, and very often, when we find what we thought we wouldn't find is when we earn, learn a great deal more. So uh, two variables could be responsible for the improvement of worker productivity overall, no matter what kind of how they set up the experiment. First of all, the, the, the time was con it was conducted. The Great Depression may have encouraged job productivity through the increased importance and rarity of jobs and the fear of losing them. So you, know, you wanted to look good when this spotlight was on you. I'm a good worker. Let me keep my job. Uh, also, during this time, uh, policies introduced breaks and rest periods and group incentive plans. So suddenly you had a change in uh, the policies and also the laws that uh, dictated how workers could be treated. And really this was more of, uh, this, this, this was much more dramatic later on. Um, it took years for, for what we, we consider to be good working conditions to become the norm. Uh, but this was a time when suddenly people realized, look, if people have more than five minutes or 15 minutes to eat their lunch, they, they may be more productive. <laughs> uh, having a little rest, uh, this, these group incentive plans, uh, maybe an occasional time, bit of time off, these may have improved productivity. So you know, times were changing while the, uh, while the Hawthorne study was uh, being conducted. So these variables could account for almost all the variation in productivity during the experimental period. It's possible. So we don't want to throw all of this out. We don't. It's, it's uh, the old saying is, "Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater." Uh, you don't want to throw out a perfectly good study 
uh, what, that has something really to teach us because part of it was was not successful or was not skewed. In a sense, it was successful. It taught us something that we didn't know before. So, you know, don't consider Hawthorne to be, you know, uh, a complete, you know, fail boat thing. Uh, so let's look at Hawthorne today and the times, it's kind of a time series analysis. What did people, uh, you know, so future researchers do with Hawthorne? Well, in 1978, new research uh, applied a procedure called time series analysis to the Hawthorne study, or to the principles of the Hawthorne study. And what it did was, uh, the, the experiment was set up, for, so two in, kind of insubordinate and mediocre workers in an organization were replaced by two more productive workers. And one would be in the role of straw boss, which is an assistant or a subordinate boss. And another would be a regular worker. So the experimenters discovered when they tried that particular combination, you took out two people who were kind of uh, viewed as, as you know, slowing things down or maybe even you know, socially speaking, kind of poisoning the environment a bit of, of uh, the social environment. Um, were taken out and fired or, or you know, laid off. And they were replaced by two much more productive workers, one in the role of kind of that subordinate boss or you know, it's, uh, lower management, and then uh, one in uh, the role of a regular worker. And their greater productivity and the effect of kind of the disciplinary action on the other workers improved productivity among pretty much all the workers. So there were combinations where, you know, the, the, the researchers found combinations um, where they could kind of turn that gear and the other gears would turn. So if you changed these variables, the other variables would change. Remember that uh, we're talking about an organization kind of like its own that's a mini society because there is interrelationship also between the between societies and just like there is between organizations. But realizing which gears, which 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 components need to be changed, and that the, the rest of the uh, organization will change kind of uh, click click click. It might not be the second it's that that the other the the first gears are changed, but that change will take place. So um, this was, just to, to kind of introduce this, uh, Hawthorne's study gave rise to the field known as industrial organizational psychology. And this is the study and application of psychological theories and principles to solve problems related to the workplace and organizations. So it's part of social and applied psychology and organizational sociology. Social psychology uh, is kind of how it's, psychology studies the individual um, because psyche means soul or the, and logia or, or means words about. So uh, just like sociology means uh, or socio means comradeship or, or basically uh, that social relationships and logia means words about. So you know, if, if sociology is studying group behavior and psychology is kind of studying the individual, uh, social psychology, in a nutshell, studies the relationship between the individual and society and society and the individual. So uh, this is industrial organizational psychology fit very comfortably into kind of being a subcategory of social psychology. But again, this is also part of, of uh, micro sociological study as well. Okay, so that's kind of, of the Hawthorne effect and, and what spawned it at the study of the, yeah, this whole study of the Hawthorne plant and what people have kind of done with Hawthorne. This, there, of course, there have been additional studies building on Hawthorne. There are, there are a thousand different perspectives on it and, and uh, we've definitely come, uh, you know, the, the research has just been explosive. You know, there's so much research out there now on, on uh, that, that is in the 
field of industrial organizational psychology. But would we have had that field if it weren't for studies like Hawthorne? You know, or would it look the same? It's kind of a speculative question. So if you have additional questions about the Hawthorne effect or the Hawthorne study or uh, other studies that kind of, it kind of spawned, then feel free to jump into that virtual office, ask your questions, or uh, you know, discuss, and have a really great day. Thank you so much for coming.